The last time that Western Europe and Eastern Europe looked the same economically was before 1492, okay? That's the last time Western and Eastern Europe looked the same in terms of their, their patterns of development, uh, politics, uh, structures, and so on. Um, from 1492 onwards, the conquest of the Americas, um, for the next 500 years, what actually developed uh, until 1917, the Russian Revolution, was that Eastern Europe became the, the, was the original third world. It was the original service area for Western Europe. That's the process uh, that, that began in the, in the 1490s all the way to 1917. It was a, the, what is a third world is a place where you get cheap resources, cheap raw materials, and that you can sell your finished products back to. Okay, so that, that was the, the, the last time the two parts of Europe, uh, the European continent, were, were similar uh, was 14, well, 1492. Since then, there's been the, the creation of the original third world, and that came to an end with the Russian Revolution, which in fact took a large part of that original third world out of uh, the, the rear area of Western Europe and began a process of independent development. That was 1917. Now, with the end of the Soviet Union in, um, let's say, 1990, uh, you can uh, disagree on the date, 9th of November 89 is the fall of the Berlin Wall. A couple of years after that, the uh, Soviet Union itself ceases to exist. You can see that that process saw the former Soviet territories go back to the third world in terms of their life expectancy, uh, their health conditions, uh, and everything else. That they went back to the third world. Well, what did the West, the first world, do in that period, it began to expand overseas. The corporations kept, uh, decided to increase. Uh, the, fi the, the physical force of the, of the West expanded. The borders of NATO kept expanding closer and closer uh, into, uh, from Eastern Europe into almost the borders of, of the former, of Russia, um, almost. But uh, the corporations kept expanding uh, and setting up shop uh, in, uh, a, a number of countries, uh, Mexico, for example, had the, uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement uh, where labor could be used for cheap uh, in, the, in the assembly areas. And the same thing is true, I think, of, of large parts of East Asia, Southeast Asia, and so on. Um, the aim of that was always to ensure that the rules of internal moves, what is called trade, but what is really, to a large extent, internal moves, intra-firm transfers, that the rules of that, the idea was always to set it up such that the rules were written by the corporations that were conducting these interfirm transfers. And so the, the free trade agreements and the comprehensive partnership or whatever else are really not free trade, but they are investors' rights agreements. They are, they are, they are the rights of the investors to manage these internal private empires to the best of their ability. Um, and they are backed by the force of law when the free trade agreements are then, uh, an act of parliament is brought in and, and put in there. Uh, and the, the defining feature of that, this is not in the Australia-US free trade agreement, what I'm about to say, but the defining feature of some of these partnerships and agreements is investor state dispute settlements, uh, ISDS. Okay, so what is ISDS? Supposing I go to a, I'm a, I'm a Western corporation and I go to a country that's just become independent after many decades of oppression and so on. Well, the court system is probably not adequate for my needs. So what I want is the ability to take that government to a private tribunal because I don't trust the local court system. Okay? And so uh, I would then pick, I as the corporation can pick uh, an arbiter, an arbitrator. The state can pick an arbitrator. The two arbitrators pick a third arbitrator, and then in a private tribunal, you have an arbitration, okay? That was the original reason for having investor state dispute settlements. The idea was that it would allow poorer countries to attract foreign investment by providing investment certainty and, uh, for, these, uh, for, for their investments. But there is simply no justification for an ISDS to occur in Australia. We have a mature court system there is no reason for that. But in fact, we do have ISDS. Uh, and these are defining features of many of these trade agreements. It means that a corporation 
uh, which, which says that Australian law has harmed its profits in some way, its investment, can take Australia to a private arbitration tribunal um, and obtain a judgment if it's successful. Okay? This bypasses the entire court system. It's a, it's a right that no human being possesses in Australia, but an immortal per a person like a corporation does possess under these, these agreements. And I, I want to emphasize that this is not the case in the Australia-US free trade agreement. It doesn't have an ISDS. But, it, but this trans-Pacific partnership or whatever that TPP became does have all these, these uh, uh, ISDS. Uh, there's, there's something very interesting about ISDS. You see, a country can't sue a corporation. It's only the corporation that can sue the country for interfering with that corporation's profits. Now that means that unlike international law, where states are repeat players, or potential profits, but unlike international law, where states are repeat players, a state has an incentive not to advance too adventurous an argument, because if a precedent is set, it can rebound on it in a subsequent dispute. But a corporation only has offensive interests. It doesn't have any defensive interests. And so a corporation can advance the most adventurous arguments in order to obtain these judgments, right? And that is a feature of, of ISDS. Why does Australia go along with, along with it uh, so enthusiastically? And here I think we need empirical data. Um, I mean, I can give you three reasons that are normally given, uh, but I'll give you some empirical data. The, f the thing that most people don't realize is that in the top 20 companies in our stock exchange, 15 of them are majority owned by American-based investors. Um, there's an article in The Conversation from a couple of days ago that I, I wrote, which traces it based on investment uh, uh, figures, the internal, uh, the filings that have been done and put on Bloomberg Terminal. So I got those figures. So uh, BHP Billiton, which is our biggest company, uh, is 73% owned by American-based investors. The Commonwealth Bank is about 63% owned by American-based investors. Okay? Rio Tinto, majority owned by American-based investors. Um, Woodside is 57% American owned and uh, about 17 to 19% Australian owned. Um, and so uh, it's doubtful that Australia at, in the economic sense has, uh, has more opportunity than California to be independent. I would say that California has, uh, has greater possibility of, of, of acting independently given the nature of, of the investment patterns and the ownership patterns. Uh, there are certain companies that don't have, that aren't majority U.S. owned, but they still have a substantial American ownership. Okay, um, uh, these are like Telstra, uh, Coles uh, are not majority American owned, uh, but Woolworth certainly is. I think it's about seventy percent. Uh, and this leads to another point that Australia is not unique in this. Um, when we talk about the rise of China and the decline of the United States, I know that there are people in the national security chin-stroking community uh, that keep talking about the, uh, uh, well, they speak quite ponderously and they talk about, you know, the after American primacy and so on. Um, they're using a flawed method. Gross domestic product is no longer the, the correct method to measure a country's power. Gross domestic product which is the final value of all the goods and services produced in an economy in a given year. American GDP as a proportion of global GDP was about 49, 46, 49 percent after the Second World War, when, of course, Europe was in tatters. There was a lot of damage. And today, the fact is that American GDP is about 20 percent or less than world GDP. And so the, uh, the, the <coughs> argument that's been made is, well, this, is, this shows American decline. And then if you take Chinese rise, the size of China's GDP relative to world GDP, and you take America's GDP relative to world GDP, the two of them are one is rising, one is falling, and this therefore shows that in the future, uh, America is gonna decline, and China, there's a rise of China, what are we gonna do about that? Uh, and it's all nonsense. It is utter nonsense. American GDP as a proportion of world GDP has declined, but American corporations have been able to expand overseas. That's the whole point of these free trade agreements and these other agreements. And so American investment holdings of global wealth is now 46%. Uh, and the source of this is a paper by Sean Stars, S-T-A-R-R-S. -R -R um, American Global, American Power didn't, it's an international studies quarterly 2013. 
okay, that it, uh, American power hasn't declined, it globalized. Uh, pretty much those words are in the title. Uh, so US GDP as a proportion of world GDP has declined, but US wealth, the actual investors, now have 46% of global wealth. They are more powerful than ever. Uh, and so policy bends in that direction. The United States government, therefore, speaks with a very loud voice. And our policymakers uh, pay attention. That also comes out in the cables leaked to WikiLeaks. We are by far their greatest investor, says the American ambassador, the American embassy. That's a, that's a direct quote. Okay. Um, and to, this is where the whole point of global value chains comes in. That it's only in a world of global value chains that you can see that American private wealth is now 46% of world wealth even if their GDP has declined. So what you've got is uh, manufacturing jobs in the US going overseas. But that doesn't hurt the interests of investors. Of course not. They're the ones that are sitting the jobs overseas. Right? Uh, I hope that's sort of tried to answer the question about uh, free trade agreements and why they are. It's, it's a conscious choice to write the rules of trade such in order to facilitate intra-firm transfers. 